All right. Well, we are live. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Randy Guthmiller. I am the manager of visitor experiences and programs for Ruby City. And it is my honor and pleasure to get to welcome you all to today's conversation with Nancy Rubens and Sarah Softness. Nancy's sculpture is permanently installed here at Ruby City in our sculpture garden. Um, it is a magnificent sculpture that people can view both from the, um, the sculpture garden and also from above inside of our building. So we are very lucky to have two um, very unique perspectives on uh, Nancy's uh, sculpture here that she created during her um, art pace residency. The work is called um, 5,000 Pounds of Sunny's Airplane Parts, Linda's Place, and 5, 550 Pounds of Tire Wire. Um, it's a truly a special experience here at Ruby City. Um, I hope you all who are visiting, watching today, have the opportunity to come out to Ruby City to experience the work in person. Um, I am so excited to hear more from Nancy and Sarah about uh, Nancy's incredible body of work and her history as an artist. Um, so without further ado, we'll jump into it with Nancy and Sarah. Thank you, Randy. Thanks so much. I am delighted to have been invited to be in conversation with Nancy. You know, it's been I guess a couple of years since we last had a protracted um, time to get to talk to one another. So this is really, really wonderful. Um, I'm gonna share my screen great. and get started. Great. It's great to see you again, Sarah. I think the last time we talked was right at the beginning of COVID. I think that's right. I remember there was I so wished I could get out to your studio and that was not possible at that time. That would have been. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay. Um, okay, I think we can see everything. All right. So I wanna start, I'm just gonna sort of cycle through a lot of the artworks that we have to share with everybody. Um, I really want to be hearing mostly from you. Um, so I am, you know, gonna give a few thoughts here and there, but um, you know, I, I would just start by saying as we look through this, um, you know, there's a kind of like I, I like to think of your work in these terms of sort of like improbable, like even to the degree almost an inadvisable quality, like thinking about trailers domestic appliances, um, airplane parts, um, being held together in these, you know, suspended monumental sculptures, um, you know, and despite that improbability, let's say, there's also just a harmony to them. There really is an inherent harmony. I think something we've talked about is a kind of logic that takes over for you in, in creating these um, bouquets almost. And, and we talked about that too. So um, it seems like, I think to me, a true testament to your handling of objects. And now here is the work at Ruby City, by the way, that Randy mentioned. So you can see where it is in situ and um, where it lives. Um, this is one of my favorites, hometown, New York City. Such a beautiful project. Um, so basically, you know, how we can see all these uh, going by on the screen, but how would you describe your work to someone who's unfamiliar with it or unfamiliar with you? Mm. You know, I, 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 I've been thinking about that. And to tell you the truth, that is almost impossible for me to do. Uh, <laughs> only because I think that if I could put in words what I'm trying to do with the work, I would, I would be something else other than a sculptor. I would be a songwriter or a poet or a I, I, I would have this gift with words, which I do not have. And 
the reason I make these things is because I have no other means of expressing whatever it is that is embodied in these works. But one thing I can talk to you about is how I got to thinking about working on this scale and using massive quantities of objects. Um, when I was a student through art, art school, college and art school, um, I took regular art classes, which involved drawing. And you drew a, a still life, a model, a landscape. You drew something where you drew your ideas uh, for sculpture or if you're a conceptual artist, you drew your ideas that you were conceiving of. And when I got to graduate school, I was mucking around with what drawing was. I, I wasn't, I couldn't figure out what drawing really meant for me. And I was a good drawer. I could draw anything very quickly and make a good drawing. And so I started drawing from different directions. I'd draw ideas for sculptures and then the sculptures would embody drawings in them. And then I would draw the sculptures after I made them. And I realized what made one thing that I discovered along the way in trying to figure out what a drawing was, what is a drawing, you know, is it a, a, an illustration of an idea? Is it a, you know, a picture of a thing or could it be a thing in itself? So I started uh, by Mark Make drawing um, massive quantities of lines, collecting all these lines on the paper. And I realized through just the co mere collection of these lines that I had a lot of energy and made lots of them, I could uh, make this thing that had this very weird depth that seemed to go on forever, this almost infinite depth and something that you couldn't see all at once, or actually, because even though it was just a drawing a thing on a piece of paper, you had to walk all around to see it all at once. And that this thing I made that was just with pencil and paper could embrace these weird contradictions became really interesting to me. Now, I hadn't, I, the only sculpture I had done at that point had been stuff with clay, wet clay, and it was always in movement. Clay is always moving and it's sloppy and you throw it or it falls down and you see this, you see a structure moving in space. And so when I got out of school and stopped being a student and had my own studio, I started collecting massive quantities of these small appliances. And I was trying to figure out a way to embody, a, embrace actually similar contradictions that I found in the drawings uh, and how to uh, make these three dimensional things that had this whole conversation that had nothing to do with the objects that I initially started with. Um, the, once I started collecting and seeing the sheer quantity of these things, like I would go to Goodwill and Salvation Army and see mountains and mountains of these little weird appliances that were all different colors and they had buttons and they had you know, little copper wires all rolled up in them. And the people of Goodwill and Salvation Army were happy to see me coming because recycling them costs more <laughs> material they could get out of them. So I would, you know, report, you know, haul all their stuff away. So I was trying to find a way to talk about something that was far from what these objects initially started to be. Yeah. And, and embody 
that stuff that I learned with the play that was about movement of form of an object in space, movement in space, uh, an object. So if I can imbue these sculptures with that notion of constant movement in relation to space, I felt like I had something. Mm. Can you just back up for a moment and share how big this is and how how big we're really talking about if if no one's ever seen some of your work in person? This is about 45 feet tall. Was. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. This is uh, another kind of growth, the piece that we just looked at, and it was uh, building between the negative space of these small um, trees in a park. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just mentioned this because I, I love how you talk about kind of drawing in drawing in space or drawing in three dimensions and thinking about movement in space. And, um, you know, it's amazing that you managed to do that with such inert objects that is sort of, and I'm curious is if there's a way in which you imagine a final product or it's all about the accretion or the building of it until you reach something that sort of says, ah, yes, that's, that's what, that's what I was sort of looking to do. Is that, can you describe your process a little bit when, when pieces come together? Um, it, it, it's more about the space that's being built in. I'll examine the space where it's to go and think about how uh, it's to live in that space or how it's to, where it can be in that space. And then we'll start to start working, which, you know, certain pieces go on first because maybe they're the strongest and the longest and the best, you know, there's logic to certain things like that. Uh, you know, I knew I wanted this to cantilever over this beautiful point of the sport, you know? So this was a work, this was a work that I initially built at, at MoMA, the modern in New York, and it was suspended from the ceiling. It's called MoMA and Airplane Parts. And it was in the projects room and it kind of lurched out from the project room into the main lobby. And here it's configured completely differently. Uh, it's anchored into the ground and it's candidly bringing like this great bough of a great branch of a tree, you know, over this uh, uh, fort. So this piece has been installed a few times and each time I've installed it. It's yielded to the environment. Mm -hmm. So the name, the initial title has kept the same. Now, the piece at, uh, at, our, at uh, Ruby City uh, was initially built at Art Pace. And uh, it was built on the patio where uh, the, pad the outdoor patio there. And I built it to fit into that space actually. And then it went to property at Linda's house. It went to Linda next door to Linda, you know, her a little sculpture garden she had next to her house. And then it moved to another site that Linda had developed. And now it's at her museum. So with this piece, the initial memory of the space that it was initially built in is still retained in the piece. Unlike an airplane parts where it kept, it was ship changing for the new environments, you know? Right. Well, it's interesting because it's sort of um, site specific, but adaptable. It's just something, those things are perhaps occasionally at odds with each other. But I know you mentioned um, embracing contradictions in general. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Like when you look at this work, what are, how do you think about what sort of inherent contradictions are here? Oh God, <laughs> good question. You know, um, I got these parts from this fellow named uh, Sunny uh, Wolf, 
and he had a whole fit sunny wolf and he has a whole family of lovely people who have this business where they have miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of these airplane parts and they're pretty much new you know i'm used to going to mr huffman who had scrap parts these are parts of airplanes but they're beautifully made and they're most of them seem brand new. Hmm. Um, and Sonny Wolf was very sweet and he would let me and my, my team go out to his gigantic place and kind of wander through these uh, rows of all these parts and choose these things that were just beautiful to me. That's just, wonderful. Yeah. And I, where is the contradiction in this? God, to pinpoint that specifically for you, I don't know if I really could. That's totally fair. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when we were <laughs> when we were talking about. Um, I'll always remember, really, when in our first batch of conversations that you were describing. There is. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of, my brain fog is coming out of it for a minute. There's a delicacy to this piece that there's this really skinny, nice, whatever that structure is on the bottom. And um, it ha it flares out into this kind of cantilevering thing that, you know, I don't know if these are contradictory points. I just am aware of uh, how we grew this thing. We we built the structure on the outside of the, um, the stainless steel structures on the outside of the elements rather than being inside it. Mm. And we built it from the outside in, you know? Well, that's interesting too. I mean, I, the, the, the thing that you said, you know, a couple of years ago when we first met and started talking and that which has stuck with me, um, for a few reasons, probably, but, you know, you said you just kind of fell down with the beauty of these airplane parts and how they were made and, you know, the kind of the line on the wing. And I'm thinking to myself, like, that's beautiful. I, I, I couldn't have seen that as such. And um, anyone who knows me knows I hate to fly. That could be influencing the way I feel about airplanes. But that is, you know, your... Um, your sensibility. And, you know, I think if you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, you have a kind of family sensibility of engineering. And so I like, kind of the way you talk about this kind of growing out from the inside really makes me think about how an airplane is made and how, you know, the, I think, a, a, I don't know that it's a contradiction, but a sort of marriage here of your artistic eye and the work that you make, your works of art that you make, um, come out of this really scientific, I think, um, and, 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 um, physical, very, highly demanding kind of scientific physical calculation. Um, and it maybe doesn't feel that way to you, but I'm telling you that from the outside, it's like, oh my God, how is that holding itself together? Um, I don't, you know, I think you're giving me more credit than I deserve with the science. <laughs> um, however, when I see these objects, I do see them as beautiful and I see the strength in them. These things have incredible integral strength, like certain elements. There's a kind of a bluish looking thing in there that looks like a barrel. That's titanium. It's such a strong material and it's such a beautiful material and it takes heat and it's really thin. And these other weird things, I have no idea what they were or are, but we thought of them as saxophones because they had this weird, strange tubular shape and tubes are super strong form. So you can always build a tube onto another tube and develop these beautiful cantilevers. So when I look at these things and when I went uh, picking and choosing my palette in Sunny's beautiful field, I was really going for, oh, that's a nice shape. That one's pretty. It wasn't really science. It was really kind of looking for things that I thought were beautiful and structurally sound. 
And to me, these highly designed um, uh, machined objects have this incredible organic quality to them. So that's what I kind of hone in on. Mm -hmm. I, I think when we make these objects, we're kind of reflecting our own selves. You know, we build them kind of like a body. They have, you know, tubes where gases and fluids run and we have electric lines where electricity and little wires where electricity flows throughout them. And you see out the front, there are these big glass windows, two of them. And, and you know, we keep mimicking figures every time we build these things. But a machine doesn't necessarily need to mimic us the way we look or animals look to work, but we do design them that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're hitting on a really lovely tension, you know, between the component parts and the, the final product that you make um, is there is something so alive and delicate and organic and dynamic about your sculptures that, um, you know, taken apart, there's, they could feel very inert, you know, they're just kind of hunks of metal. Um, and that's really, that's the transformation in the artists, you know, in the studio and um, with your eye, I think that's, um, that speaks so much about your respect for these materials, which is another thing that I've really since I got to know you I I look at these things differently now because I see like what is that potential there it's really fascinating um I I want to also say you know this particular site I think though you did not make it to exist right here it looks so beautiful right here there's obvious um just uh uh, kind of contrast in forms that's happening and contrast in tones and colors. Um, so I imagine, yeah, this is, I hope this, you know, it's interesting as having another life in this place because it is sort of gets to build on its environment. And I think um, it's excellent. It just looks so great. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, there's a uh, Ruby City's website has this great time-lapse video. Um, of this work being kind of placed out here on the lawn. Um, I know this is not even one of your most enormous sculptures, but can you talk a little bit about how your works move around the world and how they kind of come apart and come back together? Yeah, it depends upon the work. This piece was of a scale that my wonderful crane operator and my crew uh, with the assist of, I think, some permits to move some electric, some flat, you know, stoplights and stop signs and stuff like that around, uh, we're able to move it in very, very slowly, like a, a float uh, mm. down the road and, and install it in one piece, which is kind of amazing. Uh, generally, the pieces are so large, we take them apart and just simply reassemble them either like this, this work, uh, there's this a steel, a stainless steel armature that comes apart in two parts. And all the elements, these boats are individuals and we pack them in big 54 foot containers and ship them around that way, you know, and it's built on site for that moment, for that place, for that space, you mm -hmm. know. And we tend to build them relatively quickly for the scale they are, but there's a huge amount of pre-planning involved for that speedy installation, you know? Right, so I, I imagine you, there's just kind of meticulous records are kept so that people who can read a certain language for construction are able to construct it, is that? Um... No, we, we, the way that this has been constructed is, uh, I have a walkie-talkie and my crew has a walkie-talkie as walkie-talkies and there's a crane operator and the crane operator lifts one of the elements in the air and my chief installer directs him as to where it should go. And I talk to my chief installer and tell him 
okay, it looks good that way, this way, that way. And the guys tie it down with these stainless steel cables. So the stainless steel cables uh, work under tension in compression. Uh, and another, and these boats are incredibly strong on their own. So they have their own structural integrity. So we can build these cantilevers out once the stainless steel armature is in there from the center core and build from boat to boat and build these clusters. So the whole becomes much, great, much uh, stronger than the parts. And so all- So they may get constructed a little bit differently in each site if they go somewhere else. Absolutely. Ah, okay. Well, that's, that is fascinating. Yeah. I had forgotten that point. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, and I know this is so hard to put into words, but how, uh, is there some, besides it being structurally sound, what sort of dings for you when you know, it's kind of getting into the right place? Oh, uh... I'm looking to find in these things something that I, I can't see without building them. Mm. And watching them go together, it is truly uh, a wonder for me to see. I, I'm, I'm thrilled that every time another element is added to the construction and it, it keeps growing. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very satisfying, moment for me um and there's a certain point that it just seems correct mm -hmm. can't really define where that is maybe when we run out of boats <laughs> maybe it's <laughs> as simple as that but it's not as simple as that it, it it's uh it's knowing when the thing is whole uh but it also feels like it has this potential to continue growing forever. Mm. Yeah, and I remember um, just to pass forward, I know that these, um, you worked so beautifully with these like kind of multicolored boats and um, they kind of sprang up really like bouquet-like and then um, you did a similar series in monochrome, which, in certain ways, you know, I was like, it, it helped me to see something you were talking about a little better because um, I wasn't really dealing with, um, yeah, the the color quality. I was I was thinking so much about gleam and line and um, just absolutely beautiful. But I remember you you mentioned that when you started working a little bit smaller, it was extremely challenging because you couldn't just grow outward in order to achieve the harmony you were looking for, um, which I guess to me at the moment was sort of counterintuitive in a way, um, just because it does seem so difficult to to make something so, so big. Um, do you want to talk about some of your late, latest work um, and yeah. how the smaller scale of it? Yeah, uh, this is um, this is an example of a smaller piece, and it it, it has been um, a challenge for me to tell you the truth to to work in this different scale because I'm I'm very comfortable with uh, humongous. I that's kind of where I, I feel that's my comfort zone. So bringing the scale down uh, was a challenge because I needed you to be able to walk around it and for it to change continuously. So it was larger than the eye. You know, you, you couldn't see it all at once. You literally had to uh, walk around it and see it uh, from every which angle. So it was like the early drawings. Uh, you can't embrace it all at once. It's it's this. It's it's not something where you go, okay, I get it. You you need to walk around and see it and examine it. And by doing that, in a funny way, you're getting a little bit of a of a of a engineering or physics lesson because. 
you know, even myself, I look at these things, I go, wow, man, how is that thing even standing there? And then I have, oh yeah, I know why it's standing there because this wire goes to that and that goes to this. And it seems like it shouldn't be, but it is. And uh, these, I know that these cast uh, figures, these cast animal figures are tubes and tubes are super strong structures. So, you know, I have to keep reminding myself of that. And I love seeing all the cabling. So you have a real understanding of how it is there, how it actually does exist and how it is working in space, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, it's sort of heartening, honestly, to hear you say that, because I know that's my relationship to them is like, oh, my God, how just how period. Um, and, you know, it, it's, again, recalling our earlier conversations, I remember you saying, that, well, it's not some big mystery, like there's these things hang in space, because they're able to because tensile cables and the strength of this. And I, I just I found that to be um, a really kind of lovely tension, as you said, too, between what's knowable and what's sort of on faith. And so that's like a little bit of physics, a little bit of cosmic something, which I think gets at, um, you know, maybe some of what you were alluding to is your, um, if you could put it into words, you would. Um, so I want to talk about something um, kind of important that, you know, and we've discussed before. So you're obviously a formalist. You know, you have, you explore form and material and space, and you've spoken a few times now about having to walk around something and there's not, you know, you don't just get it in one glimpse. Um, and patina and light and shadow and every angle. And, um, you know, so your work isn't about, and I think this animal series is an interesting sort of challenge because um, these aren't about the objects that appear in them, you know, you're not, this isn't some take on, you know, the animal kingdom here with these lawn animals and things like that. This, I think this image actually speaks so much closer to what um, you're hoping for some of us to see. Um, but I hoped you could talk a little bit about, you know, how you do see your material, because it's not really about you know, the airplane works aren't about transportation. They're not about um, globalization. They're not, that's that's not relevant here. But, um, you know, thinking about how you do see your material and it's part of, in as part of a larger archeology. span um, It took me a while to figure this out. Uh, when I was using the airplane parts, and when I was hoarding them, collecting them, I made friends with this gentleman, Mr. Huffman. And Mr. Huffman had 17 acres of mountains of airplane parts in the town of Mojave, not north, northeast of where I am. And Mr. Huffman was an older gentleman. He was from the World War II generation. He was, you know, of that generation. And he showed me pictures of himself in the National Geographic right after World War II with, he had designed a mobile smelter and took it throughout the Southwest and melted down the fleet um, of planes after, after the war. And the aluminum was turned into other stuff. And then, so in a way, I, I, I think of myself as catching these objects kind of at a cusp that they are neither here nor there. They were this and now they were ready to become that. The appliances were somebody's happy toaster and now it's just junk and it's gonna to go to a landfill, you know, and it's gonna erode and break and be. And so I started looking at these airplane parts and thinking about how they were future stuff to be melted down. And one day I go to visit Mr. Huffman and his mountains of stuff have shrunk considerably. And Mr. Huffman, your mountains, what happened? Oh, the price of aluminum went up and, you know, I cranked up the big smelter and I was got an order for X amount of ingots, you know, tonnage and 
he melted down what you know a portion of his mountains and made them into ingots and shipped them off. I thought, okay. And then years later, after I'd used airplane parts for a long, long time, uh, a guy who finds metal stuff for me started bringing by these little uh, 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 park uh, in front of grocery stores and playgrounds, spring animals. Mm -hmm. And they were painted all kinds of weird colors and they were small and they were very, very, very thick aluminum. Yeah, you go to the one, there you go. That's our friend Fluid Metal. And so he brought me some of these. He said, you know, what do you think about these? And I thought, God, they're so strange. They're figurative and they have eyes and they have feet and they have, you know, little ears and they have springs on them. I don't, can't make what to do with these, but sure, I'll take more, bring more. So he'd bring me more and bring me more and bring me more. And then I thought, well, I should get brave and try to start working with these. And so I started working with them and I realized the thing I was making at that time, the piece was called Chunkus Majoris, started feeling <laughs> this meteor kind of a thing, this big chunk of metal flying through the atmosphere. It was chunky and thick. And, and as I looked at these silly objects I was using, and it was a big job for me to figure out how to abstract these objects, to, 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 to uh, uh, and, and that has been a trip. For me, that is my job with all of these objects. How do you take these objects and turn them into something else so that you can view them in a whole nother light? Uh, and they're not that thing they initially were, but this other thing takes on and, is, and that's what is happening. So I started, I realized the more I massed them together, and the more I wired them and mushed the colors around, I could work with them that way. But then one day I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, wow, the ones from the early 50s, the very late 40s, the aluminum on them is really, really thick. And as the price of aluminum went up, the walls get thinner and thinner. And then it, ah. That's what these are. These are the planes that Mr. Huffman smelted down in the National Geographic all those years ago. These, this is the aluminum that came back from that war effort. The soldiers came back from the war, had the baby boom generation, and these things were produced. And now I'm getting them as you're being ripped out of the playgrounds because they're safe and they're out of style and they're out of fashion and all the rest of it. So it's that really started me thinking about what these things are. And uh, I started thinking, wow, before these things were these silly little spring animals, they were something else. And before that, something else, they were something else. And before that, they were in the earth. And before they were in the earth, the earth was a big blob of stuff flying around in outer space. And it was bashing into other blobs of stuff lying around the outer space. And before that, it was dust in outer space. So I, I, I realized that the stuff that we treat with kind of flip, in a kind of a flip way, you know, let's make some spring animals. Okay, let's, okay, time to melt them down. Let's. Now let's make some lawn for, let's make some lawn animals out of them now. Now let's make some big elk and some buffalo. And so I just started, and these, uh, these aluminum animals were just freshly cast. So they're kind of the cusp too. They just, somebody just made them and they're ready to go. And so I'm just kind of catching them at these spots where they're exiting and entering and moving around. And, I thought, God, these, these large, these lawn animals, why would anybody ever have them? Or well, what are they? And you know, who are we? What, what are these things? And then I realized, ah, who cares? They're interesting objects. Uh, they have tubes and they have weird shapes. And I can definitely start mucking around with them in creating these other forms that have nothing to do with what they initially were. 
And what I love most about these is when you turn them upside down, you can see the insides, you can see the welds, you can see the mistakes of the welds, you can see the holes on the feet of the things where the, the metal was poured in and out. So it, it, it quickly uh, 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 cancels any notion of what, that these are animals. Do you know what I'm saying? They're, they're things of metal that have been, have gone through a process and we're catching them in this funny moment of time before they've been melted down or right after the May. I mean, it's fascinating. Thank you. That's such a, it's such a great answer. Um, and I, there's just something so bold, I think, about your um, take on abstraction because it uses things that we can actually discern what they are, you know, versus a Richard Serra or something like that. You know, that's so you are asking perhaps a little bit more of us, but there is the the payout is great because you really do start to understand like, wow, everything on earth is already there. We just are like remixing it in all of these interesting ways. Um I think that's just so exciting. And I, I wanted to ask you about your titles because your titles sometimes get at some of these kind of funny, you know, you mentioned one Chunkus Majoris, which is so funny. Um, and I know this series has a lot of kind of space inflected or cosmos inflected titles, um, which are also a little bit tongue in cheek. Can you talk about your titles a little bit? This has more like a, 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 this is the uh, this is dense bud. This has more horticultural. Uh, oh, uh, forgive me. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I think that um, spiral rugosa in in chunkus majoris in our friend fluid metal. That is that series from the spring animals. This series has more of a of a of a horticultural uh, emphasis. Mm -hmm. uh, the piece, the large piece that you saw by the lake was Agrifolia majoris. Uh, this one is, and another from the series, I think is called Philodendris crocodilius. Another is uh, Hog de la Ivy. You know, they're just kind of silly names that are kind of merging together these uh, uh, plant, plant things and these ridiculous tasks. Uh, animal forms. Mm -hmm. And these kind of like, they give you a sense of what the taxonomy of trying to understand the world is, but they're, they're made up essentially, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's <laughs> <great>. <laughs> um, so um, we're coming up on just about 45 minutes. I, um, a few final thoughts, questions. Um, you know, you've mentioned so much about the collecting of materials that you do. Um, can you talk, t tell us a little bit about your studio and where you're based and if, if there's such a thing as a typical day for Nancy Rubens in um, your art making practice? No, there isn't a typical, typical day. You know, sometimes I work very intensely and then sometimes I don't work for a while and I'd step back and take a little distance. So there is no typical day, um, but uh, uh, when I draw, I'm, I'm on it like at a certain, I have a certain rhythm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'm just collecting and hoarding. Sometimes uh, my crew is here and we move very fast, you know, when we're, when we're making pieces. So, uh, there isn't really a typical day. The great thing for me about living in Southern California is that, excuse me, is the weather. Right now we're having uh, huge rains and, and climate change is changing our weather quite a bit, but generally uh, we're sunny and dry. So working outside and collecting large amounts of stuff, I can uh, collect it and keep it. When I lived in New York, I had a studio that was about 900 square feet. And uh, our people would say, oh, oh, 
I have all the scaffolds you wanted. It was like, you know, so, so much scaffold. I really wanted it, but I had no place to put it, you know? So now someone offers me a huge amount of scaffold or, you know, uh, a lot of buffaloes. I have a place that I can store them and look at them and think about them. And then when I'm ready to work on them, I work very fast. Hmm. Do you have a big backlog of stuff that's just yeah. kind of yeah. very cool? Um, so, yeah, you know, we have touched on this a couple of times already in the conversation. I just want to close on this note of um, something you said. Another thing that sticks with me, which is science is an attempt to figure out how we fit into the universe and art is the attempt to figure out how that feels. Um, and I think that is, um, very relevant for your works. I think, you know, there's this kind of wonder that you're getting at with just your own kind of feeling of how things look in space, where things come from, you know, um, that whole investigation that's going on both kind of internally inside you and then kind of externally in the work. Um, but yeah, I wondered if you had any final thoughts maybe about this kind of more somehow spiritual side of things or what, what that, um, you know, the figuring out how the world feels through this work. Um, and you, you've shared really beautifully on it. So if, if you have nothing else, very fair. Um, but it's just, it's one of my favorite things to hear you talk about, so. Um, I, I'm not so sure I'm that comfortable talking about it in terms of a, a spiritual situation. I, 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 I tend to think that like scientists, artists are trying to figure out how we fit into the world. Uh, however we interpret that, it, it's really individual. Um, but scientists have a way of measuring things and a deduct, you know, measuring things, measurement in, in, in trying to find truths. You know, I, I love what the web is showing us now. You know, we're learning that, gee, the scientists that initially thought that after the Big Bang, things were really slow and moved in incremental ways until globs of Earth and stars and stuff like that, planets started forming. But now with the images that getting back from the web, they realize it happened really quick. It, it, uh, after the Big Bang and the, you know, everything was dark, stuff was going on really, really fast until the first stars appeared. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. You know, one thing was thought that everything was going along in a gradual way, but really when they got the truth, you know, their measurable truth, they found that it was far, our imaginations, it was far different than our imaginations. So I really loved that scientists do that. Um, artists are kind of, kind of blind. We're, we're kind of going about like blindly and feeling our way through this kind of odd space. We don't have those measurements. We don't have those wonderful cameras to tell us the truth. We're just trying to figure out the truth by these bits and pieces of stuff that we're gathering that from other people in the world. So uh, it's, it's a really different approach to uh, trying to find our, figure out our place in all the stuff spinning around, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, um, that's very, it's, it's true of everybody a little bit. And I think, um, to see the, to get to have the benefit of like your canvas, so to speak, um, showing us the way you do it is really, is, is really a joy. So, you know, I invite everybody who might be tuning in from San Antonio to visit the piece at Ruby City. Um, we're happy to take any questions if you have them, but thank you, Nancy, so much. This has been a joy and um, I hope to continue the conversation for years to come. Thanks, Sarah. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much. Of course.
So. So, okay, great. So I think we don't have too many questions. Randy, are we signing off or um, let us know? Yes, yeah, that's, a uh, gosh, I, uh, what a wonderful conversation. Thank you all so much. You, this was so inspiring. I'm sitting here at Ruby City and there were two um, visitors streaming your talk, sitting underneath your sculpture in the garden and it was so special to get to see that. So um, thank you, Nancy and Sarah for a very thoughtful, energizing conversation. It was really wonderful. Thank you, Randy. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you both. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. That's wonderful. The streamers on site. Sounds yeah. good. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. And I hope to see you at Ruby City sometime. You're here. Okay, thanks, Randy. Take Cheers. care, Nancy. Bye. Bye.